Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and today we're going to be attempting to answer the question, can you beat Pokemon Sword using the 6 worst first stage bug Pokemon? I've done a few solo challenge runs in the past, but I personally have a lot more fun coming up with weird and woeful teams to conquer games with. The Galar region is terribly set up for a team of bugs, with Pokemon Sword making things particularly difficult. Half of the gym leaders in Galar are terrible tight matchups for Bug, with Fire, Rock, Fighting, and Fairy all cropping up. On top of that, the region's champion finishes things with a Gigantamax Charizard, who should be a nice easy foe to take on. Finally, we have Hop, a rival who will be going through his own journey with a Flying type and a Fire type making up the core of his team. Just for some clarification, I'll be building my team with the six first stage Bug type Pokemon who have the lowest base stat totals at least the six weakest available in Pokemon Sword. Unlike a lot of my challenges, we're going to be keeping the battle style on Switch and held items will be allowed. This challenge will be hard enough without adding too many ridiculous stipulations. Of course, using items in battle is prohibited and I'll be trying to keep my levels from getting too out of hand. All right, I think that's everything you need to know. So without further ado, let's get this mess started. I did have to select Sobble as my starter so that Hop would be using Score Bunny, and then headed out to Route 1 to start my journey properly. In the grass there, we come across Caterpie, who will be the first member of our team. A base stat total of 195 makes Caterpie the 7th weakest Pokemon in existence, and yet we'll still have two weaker team members. One Pokeball is enough to secure Caterpie, and that's the last we'll be seeing of Sobble. From now on, we'll only be using first stage bug types. In the same patch of grass on Route 1, we encounter Blipbug, who's going to be the second member of our team. Wishiwashi Solo Form is the only Pokemon with a lower base stat total than the Galar region's generic early bug, so this is a rough start for our team. Once again, a single Pokeball does the trick, and we can admire our amazing starting duo now. Petrie the Caterpie begins the game with just Tackle and String Shot, so that's a pretty powerful moveset. Nice. Sunnyside the Blipbug's only equipped with Struggle Bug. That is the only move that Sunnyside will ever know, so you'd better get used to it now. Alright, skipping ahead to Route 2, I spent around an hour grinding on Tootle to add some attack EVs while also getting Petrie to the point of knowing Bug Bite. After reaching level 10, we can continue down Route 2 and take on Hop. There are a lot of important battles to cover in this game, and most of them range between 5 and 15 minutes long, so I'll be cutting a few of them down quite a bit. If you want to see them all in full, I might throw up a video on my second channel with all of the important battles in their entirety. That should be down in the description. Anyway, our friendly neighborhood rival leaves off with Wooloo, and we start out with Petrie. The sheep does manage to tackle Caterpie, but Hop's faithful companion is knocked out by a couple of bug bites. We switch out to Sunnyside when Hop sends in Score Bunny, with Struggle Bug's added effect being key. The bug type move lowers the target's special attack, and we need to give Petrie the best chance possible here. For some reason, Hop lets his attack seven times, meaning Score Bunny's special attack is basically non existent at this point. Sunnyside survives her encounter with the Firestarter, and when Petrie comes in, he's still reluctant to attack. Bugbite completes the job, but because Hop kept calling for Growl, we have to switch out to Blipbug to reset Caterpie's attack stat. After Rookity cuts down Sunnyside, we bring Petrie back in, and she earns us the win with Bugbite. Hop really handed us that win with his abysmal battle strategy, but there was enough going against us there, so we probably needed the help. After our win, we join our witless rival on the train from Wedgehurst, and end up in Galar's wild area. Running through the rain, it takes no time at all to find the third Pokemon on our list. Combi's base stat total of 244 makes her the second strongest team member, although that's largely down to a very respectable speed stat. After some good work from Caterpie, we catch the Tiny Bee Pokemon and nickname her Manuka. At level 8, she knows Sweet Scent, Gust, Struggle Bug, and Bug Bite, which is just about all she'll ever know. We do a bit of grinding in the wild area and then head onwards to Motostoke. Once there, we register for the Galar Gym Challenge and select the number 217. That will be the average base stat total of our completed team, or the closest number to it at least. Just in case you're wondering, that means our team will be just a little bit weaker than a group of six Cleffas. After being introduced to the gym leaders who are sure to give us a nightmarish time, we run into Hop on our way out of town. This basically plays out exactly the same as our first face-off with him on Route 2. His team hasn't changed and we've added Combi, so it goes pretty easily. Again, that's entirely down to Hop's incompetence. We're allowed to lower Score Bunny's special attack several stages of the Struggle Bug before he starts attacking with Ember. Petrie and Manuka brush Hop aside, and with that we can head down Route 3 to the Galar Mine. Inside the mine that connects Routes 3 and 4, we meet Beide for the first time, and he challenges us to a battle. 
As they are up against a psychic type specialist, our trio of bugs don't have any trouble for once. Sunnyside wipes out Solosis, Manuka finishes off Gathita, and then cuts down Hatena too. The next battle in line for us is the Turfield gym battle with Milo. For this one we've leveled Caterpie up to 18 and given her all of the Dynamax candy we were able to pick up in the wild area. Our movesets are unchanged but we also have Blitbug up to level 15 and Combi up to 18 too. Thankfully the game starts off with a grass type gym leader so this shouldn't be too bad. As of Gen 8 there are 7 different typings that resist bug type attacks and only 3 typings that are weak to them. So it's a nice bit of fortune to be starting off against Milo. The Turfield gym leader sends out his Gossip Lore first and we lead off with Caterpie. As Milo only has a team of 2 it just made sense to me to go straight to Dynamaxing. Seeing a Dynamax Caterpie is just the funniest thing to me, I'm not sure why, it just looks amazing. Anyway, Max Flutterby destroys Gossiflure, taking Milo down to 1 immediately. That means Eldegoss is up and as we're on a gym leader's final Pokemon that also means we're about to see another Dynamax. Milo's ace temporarily transforms into a prodigious plant and he attacks with Max Overgrowth. Of course it's not very effective so Petrie isn't too badly hurt but the Max Flutterby that she fires back with does a little more damage. After some healing we run that turn back with Eldegoss using Max Overgrowth and Caterpie attacking once again with Max Flutterby. After that Petrie's 3 turns are up so she shrinks down to regular size again. Milo calls for one last Max Overgrowth but Caterpie tanks the hit and shuffles in close to use Bug Bite. Eldegoss survives but his time's up now too. All the Pokemon in the field are now back to normal. We recall Petrie and send in Combi to finish things off. Eldegoss attacks twice with Magical Leaf but Manuka barely even notices. She strikes twice with Bug Bite taking down the Cotton Bloom Pokemon and handing us our first gym badge. That's a nice start but the difficulty is going to ramp up from here just a ridiculous amount. We're gonna have a new team member along from the ride from here on out though. On Route 5 we can finally get our hands on Ninkata. The Bug and Ground type is comfortably the strongest team member we're going to have. A base stat total of 266 makes Ninkata ever so slightly more powerful than legends like Lediba and Pikipak. Unlike Caterpie, Blitbug and Combi, Ninkata can learn a really decent set of moves that will be incredibly helpful as we get towards the endgame. Once we catch Ninkata we nickname her Panzer and then get to checking out her stats and moveset. The little insect has really good defense and knows the moves Scratch, Harden, False Swipe and Mud Slap when she joins the team but I'm sure we've got some handy TMs to use. Anyway, before crossing the bridge between Turfield and Holbury, we return to the wild area to do some grinding. I didn't want to get over leveled, but with our whole team in the low 20s we've also filled up everyone's Dynamax level. That took an obscenely long time to accomplish, but we got there eventually. In the process we got the TM for X Scissor and we taught that to Ninkata. Here's a little run through of all the items we earned in our max raid battles. Hopefully all of that experience candy will save some time on grinding later. After all of that we cross the bridge and meet Hop yet again who as always wants to battle. This one was pretty ridiculous. Our closest friend and rivals team now features Corvusquire and Reboot which dials the difficulty level up on this one massively. Wulu is first in line though and Manuka does some really solid work to take care of him. It's the rest of the battle that was troubling me though. Hop's Corvusquire comes in second and there's really not much we can do against the Raven Pokemon. Combi goes all out but a single knockout is all she'll be getting here. The pure flying types attacks are too much for Manuka to withstand and ultimately a single hit of fury attack finishes her off. Blitbug can't do any better though. Before even managing to attack, Pluck wipes out Sunnyside. Not only did Blitbug fail to deal any damage but Pluck allows Corvusquire to consume her Orenberry and return to full health. Good work Sunnyside. Anyway Caterpie's up next and Hop really drags this one out. His incompetence is making these battles possible but it's also slowing things down a lot. After a seriously long time Petrie has Corvusquire on the ropes but a critical hit on Fury attack really comes at the perfect time for Hop. That leaves our newly acquired Ninkata in a pretty ugly looking 1 on 2. Panzer's high defense comes in handy against the Raven Pokemon's attack before striking with X Scissor and leaving only Raboot. The evolved Firestarter has every advantage here. Typing, HP, base stat total, level. Everything suggests that a reboot victory is incoming.
Against all odds, Panzer picks up the win in her debut match and we can move on to Hullbury. Even with Hop's flawed strategy, this battle took a multitude of tries, but I really didn't want to grind the team up too much. Alright, let's move on. Before heading to the gym in Hullbury, I did a bit of exploring and picked up a TM behind the lighthouse. That happens to be for the only extra move that Caterpie can learn, so before visiting the gym, we fill out Petrie's moveset. Electroweb is the new addition, and I'm hoping it will come in handy against the water-type gym leader. We also added Metal Claw and Absorb to Panzer's moveset, the latter of which could be key here. The whole team's up to 27 because Nessa has a Dynamax Pokemon who's part rock and that's sure to give us some problems. Alright, let's give it a try. The Hulbury gym leader Nessa leads off with Goldeen and we send in Blitbug first. Let me just take this opportunity to tell you all how difficult Blitbug is to use. The larva Pokemon has one move at its disposal and it's not a great one. On top of that, it's a mile from having enough power to do anything with that soul attack. Combine that with abysmal defense and HP, and you've got basically nothing left to show. All of that is to say, Sunnyside falls to Goldeen fairly quickly. Blitbug does at least deal a decent chunk of damage before being knocked out, so that is something. In fact, it left Goldeen weak enough that it only took Manuka one bug bite to finish the job. Aracuda's up next for Nessa, and with Combi at full health, it's a pretty close matchup. The fish and the bee go back and forth with Aqua Jet and Bug Bite respectively, with Manuka ultimately coming out on top. Those first two team members weren't ever going to be an issue though. It was always Nessa's final Pokemon that we needed to worry about. Dreadnought was out last for the Hullbury Gym Leader and she immediately Dynamaxes the Water Rock type. Even with the Bite Pokemon towering over Combi, it doesn't stop the bug from outspeeding him to hit with a tame Bug Bite. It doesn't do a lot so Dreadnought counters with Max Darkness which decimates the remainder of Manuka's health. We send Caterpie in next and she's immediately hit by Dreadnought's Dynamax Dark Attack. By surviving that though, she's able to attack with Electroweb, which deals a pathetic amount of damage. It does at least lower Dreadnought's speed, allowing another Electroweb before Nessa's final Dynamax turn is spent on a Max Geyser. That washes away Petrie, taking us down to one. One single bug who's weak to Water-type attacks. Okay, well, we're probably gonna have one try at this. We Dynamax Ninkata as soon as she enters the battle and call for a Max Overgrowth. Absorb is not powerful at all, but by Dynamaxing, we do now have a strong quad effective attack. Dreadnought's Razor Shell would have obliterated Panzer prior to Dynamaxing, but with the added HP, she tanks the hit. That allows her to strike with Max Overgrowth, which wipes out the rest of Dreadnought's health, handing us the win. This gym battle wasn't a lot of fun, and I'm sure they're only going to get worse from here. After leaving Hullbury, we head into Galar Mine number 2. I really have to take a second to give some credit to whomever's in charge of naming Pokemon locations. They really went above and beyond with the creativity here. Anyway, inside the mine we run into Bayday for a second time, who apparently spends the majority of his waking hours hiding out in the caves of Galar. That meeting leads to another battle, and again, we're gonna skip through this. Bayday's psychic type specialty is just about the only thing we have going for us right now. Manuka makes quick work of his entire team and we can get back to what we originally came here for. We run down a wild Wimpod, and with any luck, we're about to have a team of five. The Turntail Pokemon has a base stat total of 230, but if you take away the very decent speed stat, the remaining five average out at 30. Wimpod has a unique ability that forces it to switch out or flee when its HP falls below half. That will probably be a little difficult to deal with, but I'm sure we can figure it out. We catch the Bug and Water type and nickname him Iguatsu. We also start by teaching him Waterfall, because Wimpod's going to be focused mainly on physical attacks. When we return to Motostoke, we have to take on another rival who's chosen to focus on a helpful typing. Marnie's Dark types actually put up much more of a fight than Bayday's Pokemon, but we don't need to spend more time on a meaningless battle like this. Instead, we're going to jump ahead to our third gym battle. The Fire type specialist, Kabu, has three strong Pokemon, so we've got our whole bug type collection up to level 30. We replaced Wimpod's Struggle Bug with Leech Life, which suddenly became a fantastic move in Gen 7. Other than that, things are largely the same, so let's get a move on and jump into the Motosoap gym battle. Kabu sends in his Ninetales first, and we lead off with Iguatsu. We immediately call for Wimpod to Dynamax, because we need to deal as much damage as possible as quickly as possible. After the Arthropod explodes in size, he sends a jet of water crashing into Ninetales. That Max Geyser wipes out all of the Fire-type's HP, handing us a very early advantage. Kabu sends in his Arcanine second, and his Intimidation tactics lower Wimpod's attack by a stage. Luckily, Iguatsu's first attack caused a change in the weather. The rain now falling boosts water-type attacks by enough that the attack drop goes unnoticed. 
the little bug outspeeds the dog that serves God to hit again with Max Geyser. Clearly Wimpod is set on outdoing Panzer's impressive debut because Arcanine falls just as quickly as Ninetales did. Kabu brings in his final team member Scorch, and for the first time we get to see a Pokemon Gigantamax. The burning band of raffle tickets finishes his growth spurt and is instantly blown back by a final Max Geyser. Unlike Ninetales and Arcanine before him, Scorch isn't taken down by a single shot. Kabu's ace survives the hit to counter with G-Max Centiferno, which actually doesn't deal too much damage. Three turns having passed, Wimpod shrinks back down and attacks with Waterfall. Sadly, the attack falls just short of taking out Scorch, meaning this one won't be a clean sweep for our newest Pokemon. Max Flutterby cuts him down, leaving us with four team members, but this shouldn't take too long. We send in Combi, whose speed should be enough to get us over the line. Manuka hits Scorch with Gust, finishing off Kabu and handing us the win. That third badge earns us passage to Hammerlock, and after getting pulled by rock types up and down Route 6, we find ourselves in a battle with Hop in Stow on side. You've seen enough of our rival for now though, so I'm just going to show you the one sequence from our battle that makes for vital viewing. It is probably the greatest double knockout that I've ever witnessed. We took Hop down after a few attempts, and that means we can head straight on to the next gym. The Stow on side gym leader B specializes in fighting types, so we have an interesting matchup. Of all the typings in the world of Pokemon, Bug and Fighting are the only two that aren't very effective against one another. So we're both at a disadvantage, it seems. Before jumping into this one, it's worth mentioning that our whole team is now in the low 40s and we've replaced Wimpod's Defense Curl with Attract and Ninkata's Mud Slap with Dig. Alright, that's all of the important stuff, let's get into it. B leads off with their Hitmon top and we send in Manuka first. B vs B, a matchup for the ages. Combi has the super effective stab Gust on side, but even so, she's not strong enough to make this easy. B wasted her first turn calling for counter against the special attack though, so in the end Manuka comes out on top, but it's closer than I'd like. Pangoro's up next, and with his partial dark typing, we may as well make our last attack a good one. Combi buzzes up to the bear and uses Bug Bite to deal a healthy chunk of damage. Of course, that's her last action as Pangoro slams her into the ground with Circle Throw, finishing what Hitmontop started. Blitbug's next out for us, and unsurprisingly after one struggle bug, she's taken down in a single hit by Night Slash. It's probably time to get used to Sunnyside's appearance as being brief, because even in this team of lovable losers, she's the least lovable and the biggest loser. Petrie's our third Pokemon out, and she puts in a short shift too. A couple of bug bites do at least leave Pangoro on the brink of fainting though. We're now in a 2 on 3, but with Wimpod's speed, we can quickly tie things up. Waterfall takes care of Pangoro, and Surfetched is up next. Iguatsu has the fighting type in one shot range, but a brutal swing forces Wimpout to come into play and we need to switch. Ninkata comes in and we go for the Dynamax right away. Max Quake wipes out Surfetched and takes B down to her final Pokemon. The champ comes in and immediately Gigantamaxes, which is a little terrifying. We've still got two turns with Panzer Dynamax though, so we need to take full advantage of them. The enlarged Pokemon go back and forth with Dynamax attacks, with Ninkata actually landing the better shots. After two attacks with Machamp in red health, Panzer returns to her regular size. As you watch this final blow land, I'm just going to quote directly from Bulbapedia. As Gigantamax Machamp, it swells to enormous proportions and acquires immeasurable strength. Due to Gigantamaxing, its arms are filled with power, the punches it makes can hit as hard as bomb blasts. Ninkata doesn't feel like fainting though. The bug survives the hit and digs underground to give Machamp some time to shrink. When the superpower Pokemon returns to normal, Panzer emerges, striking one last time to score the knockout, and in turn, the win. As you can probably see from the level increase, this took a rather large number of attempts, but eventually we got over the line. We're not done in Stow on side yet though. Hearing noises coming from the ancient mural, we head up the stone steps to see what's going on. Of course, Beide's just standing there, ordering an elephant to charge headfirst into a gigantic stone, because why not? He probably senses the mini cave behind, and if there's one thing we know about him, the man loves the cave. This all leads to a battle with our least friendly rival, which we obviously win with ease. I'm sure it's getting a little annoying for him that at this point he's basically been repeatedly swept by a combi. Anyway, after dealing with all of that, we can head through Glimwood Tangle to Balanly. Once we reach the secluded forest town, we take on a trainer in her home, and as a reward for winning, she gives us the Eviolite. 
It's a held item that raises the defense and special defense of a Pokemon who's not fully evolved by 50% and it's going to make Ninkata even more deadly. Ahead of our battle with the Balanly Gym Leader Opal, we got the whole team up to the high 40s but our movesets are unchanged. A fairy type gym leader alone wouldn't be a fun prospect, but the fact that three of her four team members have additional secondary typings that resist bug just seems rude. Fairy, poison, steel, and flying all resist bug, so her team is basically custom built to fend off our team of critters. Still, there's no harm in trying, so let's give this a go. Opal sends out her Galarian Weezing for starters, and we lead off with Ninkata, who we instantly Dynamax. The thing that I really enjoy about Dynamaxing is that if your Pokemon has any attack of the right typing, no matter how bad it seems, it can help you. Panzer's getting pretty used to battling Pokemon smaller than her at this point, and once she reaches full size, she strikes with Max Steel Spike. Not only is the Dynamax attack super effective, but it also gives Ninkata an additional defense boost. It isn't enough to knock out Weezing, though. Opal calls for a Fairy Wind that barely phases Panzer, and then she quizzes us about her nickname. Correctly answering that earns us a two-stage speed boost. Max Steel Spike connects once more to finish off Weezing and raise Panzer's defense once again. Opal sends in her Togekiss next, and with our last turn in Dynamax form, we call for one last Steel-type blast. That greatly weakens the Fairy and gives us a third defense boost, but sadly, Togekiss is a special attacker. A super effective Air Slash hits hard just as Ninkata reverts back to normal size. Thankfully, the earlier speed boost lets her attack first, and Metal Claw finishes off Togekiss to take Opal down to two. Mowile's next in line, and honestly, I don't even want to attack. I wish I could have the best Pokemon in existence on my team, but unfortunately, we have to battle. Intimidate lowers Ninkata's attack before another correct answer rewards us with two stage increases to both defense and special defense. At this point, Panzer's defense stat is north of 600, and even her special defense is up to a very respectable 144. She digs underground to avoid Mawile's only special attack, and then strikes with a super effective dig that leaves the fairy type weak. Mawile burns a turn using iron defense, but that won't be enough to stop dig. Once again, Panzer strikes from beneath the earth, knocking out Mawile and leaving Opal with only one. That final team member is Alcremi, but after another quote-unquote correct answer, Ninkata's attack and special attack are both given sharp increases. As the Balanly Gym Leader calls for a race to Gigantamax, and we see Alcremi transform into a gigantic 5-tier cake, I just really wish she was a physical attacker. Unfortunately, we're never going to get to see Ninkata's beefed up defense in action, but her slightly boosted attack stats on show when she strikes with Metal Claw. A critical hit leaves the Gigantamax cake below half health before we get to see G-Max Finale in all of its glory. From low health, Panzer still tanks the hit and lives to fight another turn. The Gigantamax move did recover some HP for Alcremi, so a second Metal Claw isn't quite enough. After putting on one hell of a show, Ninkata is finally defeated by another G-Max finale. We send in Wimpod, whose speedy waterfall leaves the dessert deep in red health, but then a one-shot courtesy of the Gigantamax fairy attack heals her up a bit. I really thought we were going to lose this with Draining Kiss healing Alcremi faster than Sunnyside and Manuka could damage her, but eventually a critical hit on the not very effective bug bite got us over the line. After Ninkata did 99% of the work, I was really worried that the rest of the team might mess up, but they did their jobs. Just. As you can probably tell from another fairly significant level increase, this also wasn't a first time success. Opal destroyed us in front of a baying crowd several times before we finally took her down. After returning to Hammerlock and heading east down Route 7, we run into Hop yet again and we're gonna be skimming through this one too. I would like to just take a second to say that I really like Hop as a rival. I feel like it's pretty popular to hate on him, but I don't get it. Constantly changing up the Pokemon he's using to try to overcome you makes him a lot more interesting than most rivals. Throughout the game, I think he uses like 12 different Pokemon. On my first run through, I stayed pretty underleveled, so not knowing what was coming made the battles really interesting for me. Anyway, thanks to B and Opal, we're a long way from underleveled here, so this one wasn't too bad. We actually made it through with our whole team intact and can move on to something ridiculous. For the second time this year, in a super grind-heavy challenge, my whole team got infected with Pokeras. I was actually in the process of EV training, knowing the next gym will be tough, and realized right at the end that we had it. Pokeros is extremely rare, having a 0.00004577636% chance of being picked up after any given battle. 
That makes it about 5 times rarer than finding a random wild shiny on any given encounter. If you don't know how Pokeros works, it basically just earns the infected Pokemon double effort values from every battle. Having maxed out our EVs, it was time to move on and finally add our 6th team member. On Route 8 Steam Drift Way, we encountered Snom, and with a base stat total of 185, we have to catch her. Just as slow and frail as she is adorable, Snom has the 4th lowest base stat total out of all 890 Pokemon, and yet still only the 2nd worst on our team. After quite a lot of effort, we caught the Worm Pokemon, and now we finally have a full team. We nicknamed her Plinko, and although it's a terrible nature, I wanted to stick with whatever hand I was dealt. And that's it for Route 8. Our next stop is the Sir Chester Gym, which is a terrifying prospect, but it's what we have to do. I believe I maxed out Snom's EVs right away seeing as I had the Pokerus to work with, but I didn't record it so I can't be certain. I'm fairly sure though. Going into our face-off with a Rock-type Specialist Gordy, the whole team was between 48 and 51, so around 10 levels higher on average. Rock-type moves are super effective against bugs though, so this is going to be extremely tough against a team that's almost 300 base stat points higher on average. Let's give it a go though. The Sir Chester Gym Leader sends out Barbarical first, and we lead off with Ninkata. As we've done a number of times now, we start out by calling for Panzer to Dynamax, and then get right to work. After her transformation is complete, she attacks with the quad effective max overgrowth, but it just falls short of scoring a knockout. Barbarical uses Shell Smash to sharply raise his speed and attack, which in turn allows him to strike next. A powerful Razor Shell cuts away more than half of Ninkata's boosted HP, which is less than ideal, but we push on and get the first win of the match with another Grass-type attack. Shuckles out next for Gordy, and with her last Dynamax attack, Panzer strikes with Max Steel Spike to take him below half health. The retaliatory Rock Tomb goes completely unnoticed by Ninkata, and that's largely how the rest of their face-off plays out. Shuckles' weak attacks make next to no impact as Panzer eventually brushes aside the fellow bug. With two Pokemon down, Gordy calls for Stonejourner next, and tells the Rock-type to set up Stealth Rocks. That could be an issue. When Ninkata digs down, Stonejourner uses Wonder Room. That works against us a little, but mostly it's a big help. Wonder Room flips the defense and special defense stats of all the Pokemon on the field, so we're a little more susceptible to Gordy's physical attackers, but it also massively opens up Stonejourner. Dig scores an easy knockout as the rock type has just swapped his base 135 defense stat for his base 20 special defense stat. When Gordy calls out Colossal, we switch out Ninkata for Blitbug. As the rock and fire type grows into a mountainous coal beast, Sunnyside wiggles to the middle of the battlefield and sends a tame struggle bug right at him. Max Flare obliterates the tiny bug, but our main goal here is to kill some time, so it's a sacrifice we're willing to make. We send in Combi next, and she's badly damaged by the Jagged Stone shooting up around the arena floor. G-Max Volcalith then wipes Manuka off the face of the earth, leaving us with only four. Caterpie is next in line, and like Combi before her, she's injured on entry by Stealth Rock. After getting off an Electroweb, she's crushed by another G-Max move, taking us down to three. Snom follows Petrie into battle, but Stealth Rock is really just slicing up our team. After Colossal shrinks down, Plinko hits with Struggle Bug before being finished off by Heat Crash. Now we've only got two Pokemon remaining. We send Ninkata back into battle and dig straight down. Even underground, the stones sent out by Volcalith are dealing damage. When Panzer emerges and strikes Colossal, the super effective hit wipes out his remaining health, handing us another win. Wimpod was our secret weapon here, but we never even needed to use him. This challenge has sort of become the Ninkata show at this point, and I'm okay with that. Let's move on. Down at the Hero's Bath, Sonya heals up our Pokemon and Hop asks for yet another battle. Our seemingly ever-present rival leads off with Dubwool, and we start things out with Blipbug. Thanks to Hop's unwillingness to attack, Sunnyside is actually able to force a Hyper Potion usage and then earn a double knockout. That's about as good as Blipbug can possibly do, so I'm very proud. In the second face-off of the battle, Hop once again lets us get away with attacking, this time hitting Corviknight twice with Caterpie's Electroweb. Eventually, Petrie is obliterated by Drill Peck, taking us down to 4. Snom comes out next for us, and for some reason, Corviknight continues to stall. Plinko takes down the Steel Raven with a little help from Hale, and that's the biggest roadblock overcome. Cinderace is up next, but Wimpod makes quick work of the fully evolved Firestarter with Waterfall. Hop's Pinkurchin's out next, and once again, Iguatsu gets the job done, this time with Leech Life. Snorlax comes in last for our rival and rather violently leaps onto Snom, crushing her with his entire 460 kilo body. Wimpod returns to the battle attacking again with Waterfall to score us the win over our rival. 
This cut down version made this look pretty nice and easy, but this battle was incredibly tough. I cannot even begin to explain how ill-equipped this team is to deal with the Core of Night. Anyway, that's everything we have to take care of in Surchester, so we can head on to Spikemouth to take on Galar's seventh gym leader. There was a battle with Marnie just outside of the small town, but I didn't record it. As far as I can remember, it was a pretty easy matchup. Ahead of our face-off against Piers, we taught Plinko a tract, and that's about it, I think. Piers is a Dark-type specialist, so in theory, this one shouldn't be too tough. The Spikemouth gym leader sends out Scrafty first, and we lead off with Wimpod, but after Intimidate kicks in, we switch straight out to Combi. Although she's able to get off one bug bite, Scrafty is too much and takes down Manuka with Payback. We send a Guatsu back in and he almost finishes off Scrafty with Leech Life, but the Hudlum Pokemon forces Wimp out into effect with another Payback. Blipbug replaces the Turntail Pokemon and for once she gets to be the hero. Strugglebug knocks out Scrafty and takes Piers down to 3. Malamar comes in next and Sunnyside almost gets back to back knockouts. Strugglebug badly injures the Dark and Psychic type, but a crit Psycho Cut one-shots Blitbug. We send Wimpod back in once again and Leech Life wipes out Malamar's remaining health. Piers' Obstagoon comes in third, and after Leech Life, the Dark and Normal type somehow finds a way to Throat Chop Iguatsu. That takes care of him and another Throat Chop knocks off Caterpie too. We send in Ninkata who tanks the fighting move and then strikes back with x Scissor, taking down Obstagoon and leaving Piers with only one. Skuntank comes in last, and we throw in Plinko, but she's quickly outclassed as Sucker Punch knocks her down in one. That leaves us with only Ninkata, who returns to battle and after being hit by Snarl, digs underground. Panzer slams into Skuntank, knocking out the Skunk, and although Aftermath kicks in, she just about lives through the battle. A collective 12 HP remaining, our team has just about made it past Piers to earn Gym Badge number 7. There isn't much to do between now and number 8 though, so we may as well just jump right into it. Rayhan's the gym leader in Hamalock, and he specializes in dragon types. We'll be taking on the final Galar gym leader in a double battle, which might benefit us, but I can't really tell. Rayhan leads off with Flygon and Gigalith, and we start things out with Wimpot and Caterpie. Iguatsu and Petri double up on Gigalith, leaving him in red health, but between Flygon and the Raging Sandstorm, Wimpout kicks the partial water type out of battle. We replace Wimpot with Snom as Petri takes down Gigalith with Bug Bite. Plinko then catches the quad weak Flygon with Powder Snow and leaves the dragon in red health. It's a really strong start, but when Raihan sends in his Sandaconda, Petri and Plinko are both quickly taken down. We choose the new duo of Wimpot and Combi and get back to work on Flygon. A crashing waterfall takes down the dragon and Manuka deals a little bit of damage to Sandaconda with Bug Bite. The Sand Snake's glare paralyzes Iguatsu and Duralidon comes in for Flygon. Jaden then plays Skyscraper, which gives all of his elemental heroes a 1000 point attack boost during damage calculation. That allows a max rockfall to take down Manuka, but elemental hero Snake Man's glare is redirected at Iguatsu, who's already paralyzed. We bring in Sunnyside the Blitbug, who wriggles forth and attacks both of Rayhan's team members with Strugglebug before another max rockfall blows her away. Sandaconda's Firefang leaves Wimpod low enough on health that Sandstorm can finish him off, leaving us with only one. Ninkata comes in, and she's really up against it. A Gigantamax Duraliodon and a healthy Sandaconda up against one little bug. We Dynamax and call for Max Quake, but Duraliodon attacks first with G-Max Depletion. Panzer's defense is too much though, the Gigantamax attack hardly even leaves a scratch. Rayhan calls for Sandaconda to use Glare though, so now, on top of being in a 1 on 2, Ninkata's paralyzed. She ignores the paralysis to strike with Max Quake anyway, and chunks away half of Duraliodon's HP. The Steel Dragon shrinks down to regular size and slams into Panzer with Iron Head, but again, it doesn't do much. Breaking through Paralysis for the second time, Ninkata attacks Duraliodon with Max Quake, knocking him out and leaving Rayhan with only one. Sandaconda's Firefang also fails to make a big impact before Panzer's final Dynamax attack leaves the ground type on the brink of fainting. After Ninkata returns to normal, another Firefang lands before Exes or finishes things for good. Rayhan is defeated and that means we've now earned all eight Galar Gym Badges. That means we can head straight to Winden, as we're now eligible to enter the Galar League Champion Cup. Our first matchup in the first round of the semi-finals is against Marnie, but we're so long into this video that we're gonna have to skip through this one. It's really not much of a challenge for a team of bugs to defeat a bunch of dark types. The whole thing comes to a close with Ninkata's Max Steel Spike obliterating Marnie's Gigantamax Grimmsnarl in one. Our whole team actually made it through this battle, so sadly Marnie didn't even get a single knockout in her Winden Stadium debut. Hop is next in line and you've seen this one all before. Our friend and rival leads off with Dubwool and we start out with Blitbug. 
After doing surprisingly well and almost taking down the normal type, Sunnyside is eventually taken out by Body Slam. Combi comes in second and she goes close again, forcing Hop to use a full restore before also being crushed by the Horned Sheep. Snom comes in and Hop's double almost lands a third knockout with reversal, but Plinko lives through the hit and finally hands us our first KO with Icy Wind. Corviknight comes in and cuts away Snom's remaining HP with Drill Peck and Petrie doesn't fare any better. Another Drill Peck one-shots Caterpie, taking us down to three. At this point we had to Dynamax Wimpod because we needed to try to rescue the match. I always feel a little dodgy about Dynamaxing Iguatsu because of Wimpout, but Max Geyser actually takes care of Corviknight. Pink Urchin meets the same fate with the rain boosting Max Geyser. Our final turn with Wimpod Dynamax results in another Max Geyser one-shot as Snorlax is washed away like the others. Hop sends in his final Pokemon Cinderace and calls for the starter to Dynamax. The gigantic transformed fire type is sadly blown away by one waterfall from the tiny bug and after some significant effort we've beaten Hop. This one took a bunch of attempts and I needed to use a lot of the experience candy we had on Ninkata and Wimpod. It ultimately came down to luck with Corviknight, who we needed to avoid using Drill Peck as much as possible. After triumphing in the Champion Cup semi-finals, Oleana tries to stop us from meeting with Rose and Leon so we're forced to battle her atop Rose Tower. For the first time in a long time, a battle doesn't leave us with Panzer or Iguatsu. Instead, Petrie and Plinko are the last two left standing. After taking down Rose's wild-eyed second-in-command, we can head back to Winden Stadium for the Champion Cup Finals. Beta interrupts us before the tournament begins and forces us to battle, but unfortunately this one's more complicated than usual. Under Opal's tutelage, our secondary rival has transitioned from a Psychic-type specialist to a Fairy-type gym leader in training. As I've noted before, our batch of bugs have no trouble with Psychic-types, but Fairy-types can cause some real problems. We can at least take solace in the fact that three quarters of Beide's team is still part psychic. Anyway, Beide puts up a decent fight, but ultimately Ninkata and Wimpod combine to finish off our rival for good. With Beide defeated, we can move on to the proper tournament finals. Ness is up in round one, and if you remember back to nine hours ago when we faced off against her, you can probably tell that this one won't be fun. The battle begins with Ness's Goliathopod facing off against Combi, but our whole team gets off to a slow start. At the battle's midpoint we're left with only Iguatsu and Nessa has only lost her Pelipper which hardly even seems like a loss. A couple of crunches of leech life drain Golisopod's remaining HP, getting Wimpod into a 1 on 3. Sea King comes in next and Iguatsu uses his Bug-Eyed Charm to attract the Regal Fish. Love immobilizes Sea King for back to back turns allowing Wimpod to pick up another big win with leech life. All of a sudden it's a 1 on 2 and Barrascoot is next in line. The Skewer Pokemon also falls for Wimpod's dashing good looks and makes it four consecutive turns that Nessa's Pokemon have been infatuated. Leech Life knocks off the water type and against all odds Iguatsu is forced to one on one. Dreadnought comes out last and Nessa activates her Gigantamax form which is pretty scary as a partial rock type. Attract puts another Pokemon under Wimpod's spell and Dreadnought makes it five turns of infatuation on the bounce. Waterfall crashes down on top of Nessa's ace, but it doesn't deal too much damage. Luckily for us, Iguatsu's charms buy us even more time. A second Waterfall takes Dreadnought below half health, and after a track works for us again, the Horned Turtle transforms back into a regular form. Wimpod summons one final Waterfall that slams Dreadnought into the stadium turf, knocking her out and handing us the unlikeliest of wins. The odds of Nessa's Pokemon being immobilized by love seven turns in a row is a little under 1%, so that really was incredibly implausible. Advancing to round two, we've been drawn against B, who's another gym leader that gave us a lot of trouble. Since taking her on in Stow on side, the fighting type specialist has traded out her Hitmontop and Pangoro for Volucha, Grapplock, and Phalanx. We lead off with Combi against B, as is tradition, and after sacrificing Sunnyside, Manuka knocks Volucha out of the sky with Gust. Phalanx comes in second and causes us some real problems before eventually going down to Plinko's Icy Wind. Surprisingly, the Ice type actually gets back to back wins with another Icy Wind finish on Grapplot. We Dynamax Ninkada after Snom is taken out, and Max Quake blasts Surfetch out of battle to leave B with only one. Machamp is up last, and once we've burned through three turns of her Gigantamax form, Iguatsu earns us the win by taking down the four armed fighter with Waterfall. Now that we've defeated the Stow on side gym leader, we can head onwards to the battle which will decide who faces Leon in the championship match. Rayhan will be our third round opponent, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Our team actually matches up pretty well against his, so I'm not going to complain. The Dragon-type specialist leads off with Torkoal and we send out Wimpod first. 
After an unbelievable performance against Nessa, Iguatsu starts well again here. Even though Waterfall only has a 20% chance of flinching the opponent, the Turntail Pokemon lands two in a row to take out Torkoal. Rayhan's Gudra comes in next, and after going back and forth with Plinko, Wimpod returns to battle to score his second knockout. Somehow against Rayhan's Turdinator, Iguatsu's Waterfall manages to cause a flinch for the third time in a row. Another cascading water type attack washes away Turdinator, leaving Leon's self-proclaimed rival with only two. Wimpod makes it four flinches in succession against Flygon, which is like a 1 in 625 chance. Essentially, Iguatsu is just ignoring the laws of probability at this point. A second waterfall knocks out the dragon, taking Rayhan down to his final Pokemon, Duraliodon. After battling through his three turns of Gigantamax, our Dynamax Ninkata eventually finishes the job with Max Quake. Having taken down Galar's 8th gym leader for the second time, we can finally move on to battle the region's champion. When we come onto the field for our face-off with Leon though, Rose pops up on the big screen to deliver a classic bad guy monologue. He tells us that he's set the darkest day in motion, and that means our match with Leon is off for the time being. Instead of doing that, we have to head to Hammerlock and go underground to the energy plant to take on the chairman of the Galar Pokemon League. As a Steel-type specialist, the president of Macrocosmos is at a pretty major advantage here. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it was at this point that I started to think maybe, just maybe, this game wasn't designed to be beaten by a team of terribly feeble bugs. Escavalier, who's up first for Rose, is not a fun opponent. With triple-digit attack, defense, and special defense, and a single weakness that we can't exploit, the cavalry Pokémon is a pretty excellent foil for our team. By the time Panzer scores a knockout with Dig, the cavalry Pokemon has already sliced through half of our team. Luckily, Ninkata wasn't in that number. What I love most about making these challenge videos is coming up with new strategies and discovering strengths in Pokemon that I would ordinarily never use. I think it's safe to say Wimpod and Ninkata have been the stars of this run, and I've actually had a ton of fun using them both. After knocking off Escavalier, Ferrothorn, Perserker, and Klingklang, all fall victim to Panzer's overwhelming power. The final hurdle to overcome in this one is Chairman Rose's Gigantamax Copperaja. The Steel-type's Gigantamax form is basically a brick wall with tiny arms and a theme park water slide for a trunk which looks completely ridiculous, but even so, Copperaja easily wipes out Blipbug and Combi. Those are just the mini-bosses I throw out before bringing Ninkata back in though. Dig takes down Elmer the Patchwork Elephant and hands us yet another win. It also makes it a total clean sweep for Panzer, who eliminated every single member of Rose's team. After taking down the Chairman, we can head up to the Tower Summit, where Leon and Charizard have been dealing with Eternatus. The Galar Champion attempts to catch the Legendary Dragon, only to see the Pokeball he threw snapped clean in half while his ace guards us from the blast. Really though, Leon? A Pokeball? Being the Champion must pay pretty well, splash the cash, go for an Ultra Ball. Now is not the time to cheap out. Ultimately, this leads to a battle between us and Eternatus that of course comes down to just Blipbug and the Poison Dragon. Sunnyside is simply too powerful in the end, and a not very effective struggle bug hands us the win. That was nice. She deserved that. Alright, having added an unnecessary non-bug to the box, we can now return to Winden Stadium to get our battle with the Galar Champion underway. All of our hard-fought victories will mean nothing if we can't win the big one. Leon throws his cape aside and sends out Aegislash to start things off. We bring in Ninkata first, who's really going to be very important in this one. Although it may seem like a big risk against a full team of six, we start by Dynamaxing Panzer because it's our only real option. Leon calls for King Shield to protect Aegislash, but Max Quake is too powerful and breaks through to inflict some damage. Not only that, but we get a nice special defense boost. A second super effective Dynamax move knocks out the Sword and Shield to give us an early lead with Ninkata's HP untouched. Dragapult comes in second for Leon, and this is why that early Dynamax was necessary. It was absolutely essential that we got those early special defense boosts in, because Dragapult combines frightening speed with high special attack to make his flamethrower absolutely terrifying for our whole team. After the double stat raise with our boosted HP and Eviolite in play though, we hardly have to worry. 
I did teach Shadow Ball to Panzer prior to facing off against Leon, but even though it's super effective, I think Max Quake will do more than Max Phantasm, so we plump for that once more. That takes Dragapult way down into red health, but that's probably not a good thing. After Ninkata shrinks down to regular size, we call for Shadow Ball, knowing well what's coming next. Leon uses a full restore to heal the stealth Pokemon right back up. The Ghost-type attack bubbles into Dragapult slowly, not doing too much damage before Ninkata's hit by a second blast of Flamethrower. It still hurts even with everything we've got going for us, so not wanting to take any more damage, Panzer digs down. After narrowly avoiding a third flamethrower, Dig lands and takes Dragapult down to deep, deep red health. That's unfortunate. Panzer is caught in the blaze once again before finally finishing off the ghostly dragon with X Scissor. That could have gone a little better, but we've still got our full team standing. Haxorus is up next for Leon, and we're sticking with Ninkata for now. The bug is easily outsped by the dragon who attacks with Outrage, but her monumental defense stat leaves her standing on 7 HP. That allows another use of Dig and in turn a missed Outrage, but unfortunately Haxorus isn't done yet. In an ideal world we would have ended Outrage and started the confusion there, but this isn't an ideal world as is abundantly clear. To make up for that disappointment, Ninkata emerges and lands a crit to help out, but with Haxorus still standing, the end is near. Outrage wipes out the few hit points that Panzer had left, and finally we've lost our first team member. We call on Wimpod to finish the job, hoping his speed will be enough to outmaneuver the dragon. Leech Life does indeed come first, and it takes out Haxorus, making it a 5 on 3. Leon's got no great matchup for Iguatsu and calls on his Rhyperior next, who must be hoping a Sky High defense stat will be enough to stop a one shot. Wimpod summons a Waterfall before the heavily plated Drill Pokemon has time to register what's happening. The quad effective attack hits its mark and Rhyperior's HP ticks from 100% all the way down to zero. Now, with only two Pokemon to go, I'm going to need you to think back to four days ago when you started watching this video. We selected Sobble as our starter, meaning all of our battles with Hop would be nightmarish, but in turn it led to Leon taking Grookey. The Grass starter is now a fully evolved Rillaboom, but it's still definitely a help for our team of bugs. We recall Wimpod for the moment and send in Combi, who darts in close to attack with Bug Bite before the drummer finds his feet. The super effective hit is countered by a rather pointless endeavor, which Manuka hardly notices before a second Bug Bite hits extra hard and knocks out Rillaboom, leaving Leon in a 1 on 5. You know what's coming next, though. This one's a long way from finished. The Gala Champion sends in the original Firestarter and calls for the Beast Gigantamax. I'm not sure I've ever seen a sight quite as hopeless as Combi fluttering around in front of Leon's Gigantamax Charizard. The champion calls for Max Rockfall and as the enormous boulder topples and lands on Manuka squashing her, I do feel a little bad. Honestly, Charizard could have spat a pebble at Combi and it would have blown her away. That was probably overkill. I'm sure nobody wants to go next, but after drawing the short straw, Snom sent in to face what must surely be her worst nightmare. Leon calls for Charizard to use G-Max Wildfire, which, again, is probably a bit much. If a pebble was good to deal with Combi, poking Plinko with a sparkler probably would have done the trick. Wildfire engulfs the field around Snom, scoring an incredibly easy one-shot, and after a few games of Rock, Paper, Scissors, Caterpie's next on the chopping block. At least Max Rockfall makes it quick for Petrie. There's no dragging things out. Petrie is unconscious before truly registering what she's up against. Alright, Blipbug's up next. She took down Eternatus, so this one should be a piece of cake. Having endured... that's not the right word. Having floundered through three turns against Charizard, Leon's ace is forced to return to his regular form, which truly isn't much better. Sunnyside is made of tougher stuff, though. The bug majestically dodges Charizard's Fire Blast before attacking with a four times resisted struggle bug that, unsurprisingly, doesn't do much. It does lower Charizard's special attack, though, and that could be huge. Sunnyside is injured by the sandstorm and the flames that surround our side of the field, which distract her for long enough to allow Fire Blast to connect. Remember when we had a 5-1 advantage? Well, now we're down to a 1-on-1. One -on -one. The sandstorm subsides and we call in our final Pokemon Wimpod once again. Charizard is fast, but not fast enough. Iguatsu strikes quickly with Waterfall and the super effective blast floods the stadium floor, extinguishing the flames and putting an end to Charizard's reign of terror. Somehow, we've defeated Leon to become the Pokemon League champion. With that, we have officially beaten Pokemon Sword using the six worst first stage bug Pokemon. 
You may have picked up on the rather significant level increase before the Leon battle, and that's because it took a ridiculous number of tries. By the end, I had everything down to an exact science. I really wasn't entirely sure Waterfall would be enough there because it had done around that much damage before, but luckily we got over the line. I loved using this team honestly. By the time you see this, I will have been working on this video for almost two months. It really took a lot of time to put together, so if you made it this far, I really hope you enjoyed. Seriously, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.